Good morning, everyone. This is Archbishop Richard Gagnon, and this is our Friday morning report for December the 16th. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm speaking to you this morning from the Catholic Center in downtown Winnipeg, and uh, always appreciate this opportunity uh, of communicating with the people in the Archdiocese through this Friday morning report so close to Christmas. Um, just recently, I returned uh, from the Diocese of St. Paul, Alberta, to attend the ordination of the new bishop there, Bishop Gary Franken, who replaces Bishop Paul Terrio. Uh, bishop Gary uh, is of Dutch heritage, second generation in Canada, and uh, he was formerly the Vicar General of the Archdiocese of Vancouver. Um, I'm just going to mention a couple of things about St. Paul, Alberta, because we probably are not that familiar with it. I know I was, and it was my first time there. The town of St. Paul, uh, is where the cathedral is located for the Diocese of St. Paul. And um, in a certain sense, it's an interesting piece of Canadiana. It was originally a Métis community known as St. Paul de Métis. And um, it seems like it's very similar, the story, how the foundation of the city uh, or the town of St. Paul, very similar to some of our French-speaking communities in the Archdiocese of Winnipeg, west of Winnipeg. It seems that missionaries came from Quebec and uh, they attracted many French-speaking people uh, to where they were, establishing communities where people would feel safe uh, in their French language and culture and their Catholic faith. In a sense, St. Paul, like many of these communities in Western Canada, was a safe landing for French Canadian Catholics and Métis Catholics in Western Canada. It's a town of about 6,000 people and boasts of a very beautiful cathedral church, a large church for the size of the town for sure. But in modern times, it's part of the, um, uh, the current uh, oil patch in Alberta. And that means that there are towns within the diocese much larger than St. Paul. For example, Grand Prairie or Fort McMurray, Lloyd, Lloyd Minister, Alberta as well. And like uh, CFB Shiloh, which is the main military base for artillery regiments in Canada, Coal Lake, Alberta is only an hour from St. Paul, and that's where many uh, Air Force fighter pilots train from around the world in different countries. It's a major center for that aspect of our Canadian Armed Forces, located very close to St. Paul itself. Now, I mentioned St. Paul is a safe landing for early French-Canadian Catholics. Uh, it's kind of a humorous play on word because St. Paul itself features the only um, UFO landing pad in the world. And it's one of those cases where you find um, very creative city councils wishing to promote their, their town by using uh, certain themes, and that's one of the themes uh, for this town of St. Paul, which features a museum of unidentified flying objects, and by so doing encourages entrepreneurship and tourism in that particular uh, center in Alberta. And so, um, kind of an interesting little story. We don't see that much t uh, kind of creative entrepreneurship anymore as we once did in the 1960s, for example, but it kind of lends a certain flavor to the town itself. Speaking of flying objects, I'm going to show you on the screen right now the, uh, a few aerial shots of our retreat center that's part of the Arch Archdiocese at present. As you know, we were gifted with the retreat center, St. Charles Retreat Center, on the banks of the Assiniboine River. And um, we are in the process of making the transition to an archdiocesan facility. It's very important for Catholics in the city of Winnipeg and beyond because it's the only retreat center now that is left operational since the closure and the repurposing of the St. Benedict's Monastery just outside of the city of Winnipeg. And so we are working with the Assumption Sisters of Nairobi uh, to um, have coordination within the retreat center and to work at reestablishing that retreat center as an active facility in the Archdiocese. Please keep this project in your prayers. It's a very important one for the Archdiocese 
and for Catholics, not only for Winnipeg, but also St. Boniface and beyond. In addition to these uh, few points this morning, I wish to draw your attention also to the Archdiocesan Electronic News Bulletin uh, called the Archdiocese of Winnipeg Weekly News uh, that goes to many people in the Archdiocese who subscribe to it by through email. And uh, you'll find there a whole list of important items uh, regarding activities within the Archdiocese. And uh, th there's any number of items there that could be of interest to, to people. One, one point that uh, got my attention this past week was something entitled Pro-Life Nurses Mentoring Program Launched. Um, a mentoring program for uh, student nurses. I think this is a very important point, actually. Um, the Canadian Physicians for Life uh, has created this mentoring program for student nurses. Student nurses that hold uh, life-affirming views, faith-based views uh, relative to the sanctity of human life, uh, can be matched up with professional nurses who hold the same views that will help them on uh, the student's journey to uh, professional accreditation. Uh, in our health system, of course, we have the reality, a growing reality, actually, uh, of abortion and MAID, medical assistance in dying, and there is an increasing pressure on our professional people uh, to adapt to this. And um, if, we, if we hold life-affirming views, faith-based views, we can feel the pressure that is very much present today. Canada has moved from allowing euthanasia in specific circumstances to allowing it for non-terminal and non-irremediable illnesses. More recently for people with social burdens even, as is, uh, this is in the process of being extended to people with mental illnesses in the spring even though hearings are continuing regarding that. Euthanasia advocates are raising the possibility also of allowing euthanasia for people with physical handicaps as well as for children with severe illnesses. Cardinal Collins recently spoke at the Cardinal Dinner in Toronto and uh, he regretted the steady decline of society's principles regarding respect for life. He asked the people attending the dinner a simple question what have we become? You know, one of the last, uh, one of the recent Friday reports, I mentioned the importance for parishes as a possible way of reaching out to people who are isolated and are vulnerable by serving as a bridge to resources in the community to assist people. At the same time, there's another aspect uh, of isolation within our communities that we don't often mention, and that is those in the medical profession. Uh, the student nurses uh, can experience a sense of isolation in class and in clinicals because of the growing acceptance of MAID and abortion. We talk about, and rightly so, about the growing pressure on our medical system because of costs, and also the uh, increasing number of COVID cases and respiratory viruses as well as the flu. But within all of that stress within the medical system, there are personnel who are under strong pressure uh, in the current environment regarding abortion and MAID. And uh, therefore, I think we need to be aware of that and raise up that question. We need to pray for and support those in the medical profession who continue to see medical care as life-affirming. For student nurses, the registration can be found in the article I mentioned above in the newsletter. On another matter, the church has been involved in life-affirming approaches uh, to relationships, and I've mentioned a number of times uh, the important work of Returning to Spirit, RTS, and uh, its work in furthering reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. Um, it's the only process that I know of that actually affects reconciliation. It doesn't just talk about reconciliation. We actually experience reconciliation through these workshops that are being offered. And they are available from time to time in the city of Winnipeg. So I would encourage you to think about taking one of these workshops. 
and certainly through the news bulletin, their advertised, and other means as well. Um, a couple of specialty workshops are being offered in January, uh, from January 12th to the 15th. For people who were involved uh, in the foster care system uh, in, uh, in Manitoba, non-Indigenous people, uh, there's a workshop, a four-day workshop, if you might be interested, if you have that background and experience, uh, from January 12th to 15th. And also for Indigenous people who are involved in the uh, foster care system from January 20th to 23rd. Uh, both of these workshops, the information is on the screen. Uh, it may apply to, uh, to your experience and uh, you may find it, in fact, I'm sure you'll find it very helpful indeed. In addition, there is a special workshop for youth, young adults uh, between 18 and 30 on January the 7th, a one-day workshop called Seeds of Reconciliation. I would strongly encourage uh, our young people to consider taking uh, such a workshop. It says you are eligible to attend if you are between the ages of well, 17 and 30. Um, and you have or have been in the past connected to a religious group or consider yourself to be a person of faith. And the information is on the screen. It's a good opportunity to learn about reconciliation, what it really is, and indeed how relationships break down and the causes for it. Um, finally, I had a recently, I had a beautiful experience recently uh, at uh, the Sandy Bay First Nation on Gaudete Sunday. Uh, I was asked to go and visit the uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe Church at Sandy Bay. And a beautiful confirmation ceremony was celebrated for 21 people with varying ages uh, from 12 years of age to adults. It was a moving experience, very well organized, and it really showed the importance of family relationships. A number of families were involved, of a community spirit for sure in the community, and of course our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now, these are very real things and very important. And um, that was a, a beautiful and powerful event. Every now and again, when I move around, I bump into younger people whom I've confirmed in Winnipeg or outside of Winnipeg. And it's always a, a great pleasure for me to experience that. The other day I was having dinner in a restaurant and the uh, young lady who was serving the tables, maybe she was 20 or 21, I don't know, and she kept looking at me and she said, are you the bishop? And I said, well, yes, I am. And she said, you confirm me. That was amazing. And then I said, do you mind if I ask you a question? And she says, no. I said, are you still praying to the Holy Spirit? And she said, yes, I am, with a great deal of conviction. You see, it's very real. Uh, in a case like that, it just brings home the fact that confirmation and those who pay attention to the Holy Spirit in their life is a powerful reality for sure. Well, with this coming Sunday, it's the final week of Advent. And, um, you know, in some respects, Advent can be compared to nighttime, in a sense. And the final week of Advent is the few hours before the dawn. People look towards the rising sun, just like a woman experiencing uh, pregnancy, in the last moments, the last days prior to the birth of the child, it's a time of great expectation. So the last week of Advent is a time for prayer and special attention. The church sings the O Antiphons from the 17th of December to the 23rd of December. And the O Antiphons are simply titles of Jesus that begin with the letter O. For example, O Lord, or O Lawgiver, or O Son of Justice. The evening prayer features these antiphons and is a special time of prayer and attention prior to the celebration of the birth of the Savior. We're probably familiar with O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, the hymn. Well, that covers all the various titles of Jesus that the church celebrates during the last week of Advent. So for our Friday report, next Friday we'll have the Christmas message and after that, for two weeks, there'll be a break in the Friday report. So I want to thank all of you for joining me this morning for this um, Friday morning report. 
And uh, may you have a blessed fourth week of Advent and prepare well for Christmas. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.